Hello everyone, welcome to GGN. Today is Friday, October 19th, 2012. I'm Darko. I'm going to cover the Middle East in these uh, two videos for today. The first article I have is about Libya. 11 Libyans killed in new Baniwali clashes. 11 people have been killed and several others injured after Libyan ex-rebels operating alongside the army attacked the northwestern city. The town was shelled from three fronts today. A local official in the former city said, then from Land Destroyer Report, international law suffers another blow in Libya conflict. NATO silent as its uh, client regime vows no mercy for city of Bani Walid. The U.S. invoked the so-called responsibility to protect or R2P doctrine as justification for the NATO military intervention in Libya based on the fears that the Libyan government was about to enter and eliminate systematically resistance in the eastern city of Benghazi. This was based on alleged statements made by Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi claiming he would hunt armed resistors door to door. The cover of the ISIS report on the responsibility to protect, also known as R2P, is a geopolitical mechanism used to couch foreign military aggression within humanitarian concerns. Kind of interesting they use the word ISIS. A little sun rays. NATO's use of the doctrine RTP in Libya was based on evidence now admittedly fabricated by the Libyan opposition itself, with a military intervention killing by far more people than the violence it claimed it was stopping. And additionally, the intervention installed a government guilty of documented and sweeping atrocities that dwarf accusations made against Gaddafi. This includes NATO-backed rebels exterminating a city of 10 to 30,000 black Libyans. Also, it says... A lot of people who supported Gaddafi are hiding now in Bani Walid. We have a list of names they are fighting very well because they know they are going to die soon. This comes from a title uh, article, Confusion Rife as Libyan Army Storms Town at Bani Walid from the London Guardian. Back in 2011, Obama uh, defended the military intervention in Libya by saying, to brush aside America's responsibility as a leader and more profoundly our responsibilities to our fellow human beings under such circumstances would have been a betrayal of who we are. Clearly, clearly, this uh, above um, act as far as going up there in Bani Wali and just killing anybody else that's uh, left as far as uh, people that are loyal to Gaddafi is a clear case for the R2P, rights to protect humans, as the West claimed it had in 2011. Paragraph finishes by saying the people of Bani Walid are fighting for much more than just the fact that they are supporters of Gaddafi. They're basically fighting for their lives. Talking about human rights, this is a picture of the home of up to 10,000 people. The video claims up to 35,000 people, uh, part of Libya's black community and ha who had resided in the country for generations. The uh, inhabitants were either exiled, imprisoned, or exterminated, and the NATO rebels, Western-backed rebels, said every single one of them has left and we will never allow them to come back. Libya, like Iraq and Afghanistan, are all warnings of the dangers of international law that presumes primacy over state sovereignty says NATO's failure in Libya, exposed from the beginning as a war of aggression built on a pack of lies, should provide ample evidence as to why NATO should be excluded from any further role in international conflict resolution, of course in the name of uh, humanitarianism, beyond the borders of its membership. And then to Syria from the Lou Rockwell report, Implosion of Syria Myths, a nervous breakdown for U.S. allies. The New York Times finally reported what many watching the Syrian insurgency have noticed all along. U.S. facilitated weapon shipments are ending up in the hands of radical jihadists. Of course, those facts are right. Blinded as it is by the ideology gets the conclusion wrong. The Times has for some time been pushing a line that the U.S. must act fast militarily in Syria, lest the mythical people uprising be hacked by radicals hijacked. But it goes in and says, in short, they have been surprised distorting facts to propagate for war. The New York Times line is that the U.S. inaction on Syria is leading to radicalization of the rebels. Earlier this month, they reported that many Saudi and Qatari officials now fear the fighting in Syria is awakening a deep sectarian animosities and barring such intervention could turn into uncontrollable popular jihad with consequences far more threatening to Arab governments than the Afghan war of the 1980s. Then it goes on and says, now we get the news from the Times that basically they're receiving, these jih jihadists are receiving the weapons that the West are sending over in the uh, aid. And it follows by saying, you know, how the policy was a blunder and that instead it's sowing the seeds of future insurgencies hostile to the United States. So it's doing the very opposite of what they set out to do. So what is the truth? Well, it's hard to swallow. It goes on and says, Assad was telling the truth when he told Barbara Walters in an interview earlier this year, not everybody in the street was fighting for freedom. 
you have different components. You have extremists, religious extremists, like-minded people of Al-Qaeda. From the very first weeks we had those terrorists, they are getting more and more aggressive. They have been killing. We have 1,000 over 1,100 soldiers and policemen killed. Well, who killed them? Peaceful demonstrators? This is not logical. Of course, no one wanted to listen to him because he, like Saddam, Milosevic, Gaddafi, were branded madmen in the media. And uh, you basically, who can listen to madmen? So says, we've heard all this interventionist neocon garbage for decades, but for some reason it still seems to work. It is a myth that the initial peaceful protests only turned violent reluctantly after they were met with force by the regime. So the whole point was, of course, what? Violent regime change that was, you know, conducive to the West. So it says we saw it in the influential think tank Brookings Institute report titled Saving Syria, Assessing Options for Regime Change. Uh, the article finishes up here by saying that it's really bad news. As the U.S.-Syria policy falls apart, there's increasing danger that built up tension in the region, particularly the disastrous decision of Turkey to support the rebels is leading to a wider conflict that threatens to spin out of control. Tur Turkey and Armenia are at each other's throats. Armenia and Azerbaijan are preparing for war. Iraq rarely watches chaos on its borders, which I've been covering, and Russia is installing its next generation of S-400 anti-aircraft missiles on its southern military region near Turkey. Backed into a corner by failed policy, the U.S. is doubling down on bad debt feeding Turkey bogus intel about arms shipments aboard Syria passenger planes carrying Russian passengers. Rebel mortars lobbed into Turkey give a desperate Erdogan government pretext needed to establish a buffer zone in Syria. They move tanks and jets also to hope for NATO reinforcements, which are not coming. French observer Thierry Massian says that Turkey is on the verge of a nervous breakdown after NATO packs it in on Syria. So that kind of sets the uh, stage for what I'm going to talk about here. Turkey stages new war games near border with Syria. They've staged new war games just 10 kilometers from the country's border with Syria amid simmering tensions between the two neighbors. So here's some of the tanks that I was talking about that were shipped to the border. On October 4th, the Turkish parliament authorized cross-border military action against Syria when deemed right. At least 44 were killed in northern Syria airstrikes. Children among slain in government strikes on strategic town from October 18th. The Syrian military attempts to reclaim the important city of Marait al numan ended in tragedy when the airstrikes against the rebel-held city end up killing not only rebels but civilians as well, including children. Residents of the city have come under near constant bombardment since it fell last week to the rebels with warplanes regularly overhead. This is the first time, however, that such a number of civilians were reported slain. Then captured Syrian, Syrian pilot says, I just followed orders. Video says he uh, that pilots were unaware they were hitting civilians. So as he was shot down by the rebels, um, he has a simple explanation for why he and other pilots had no qualms about bombing civilian targets. He said he swears he didn't know civilians were present. Um, this is coming from Al Jazeera. This is so interesting, too, because there's actually, uh, was it Bradley Manning in that? He's in jail. He'll probably get the death penalty for what? For exposing, um, you know, U.S. war crimes, uh, you know, just uh, hitting people with Gatling guns, basically, from helicopters and stuff like that. Uh, I think there were civilians or journalists. So it's like, you know, uh, don't worry about that. Let's focus on this. I call it, you know, it's a diverting people's attention they told us you know because people have short uh, attention spans and memories of history and that so they told us there were armed terrorists there he said uh, and was empty of civilians our commanders told us this and we can't see anything on the ground we can't or don't go outside the air base then you have tensions among Alawites pose new challenge for Assad. So rumblings of discontent within Syria's Alawite minority are presenting a new challenge to Assad's efforts to re retain power, which calls into question the loyalties even of his own sect in the conflict-ravaged country. He's come to rely on the 2.5 million strong Alawite community for support as Syria's Sunni's majority has flocked to join the rebellion. Sunni Islamists may play a major role should the rebels win, it says a shootout between members of the extended Assad family and the president's home last month and the detention of a prominent Alawite activist by the regime offers hints of unease within one segment of the population whose unwavering support for Assad, whose loyalty prior to that had not come into question. So I don't know if this is like the defections kind of propaganda, right? Because that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to put the pressure on them to have people defect. Long cultivated by Assad, Syria's business elites feel squeeze of war and sanctions. So Syria's wealthy, long cultivated by uh, Assad as support for his government are seeing their businesses pummeled by the bloody civil war. 
So it goes on, he says he may not have lost the backing of the business elite, but some are losing faith. So again, this is propaganda. They're telling them to leave. Well, I'm not in Syria, so I don't know, but it's getting pretty bad there, and it could be true. There could be some truth to it, but it says here, now Syrian rebels have missiles. Meanwhile, war reaches Damascus, the wealthy. So this could change things. Some Syrian rebels now have anti-aircraft missiles. So it says the fighting uh, basically is isn't as tense as other cities like Aleppo, but drastically increased a few months ago. Checkpoints abound, uh, kidnappings are common, bombings are increasing, it's not safe to go out after dark, so maybe that pilot was telling the truth. So yeah, and Harris talking about the wealthy again, right, from the AP. Many have seen factories burn, and others have had their money restricted by sanctions. Goes on and talks about the Alawite community again, so. Anyways, CIA spies smuggle 14 missiles into Syria so rebels can take out regime warplanes. The ground-to-air weapons have been delivered across the Turkish border and were partly paid for by Saudi Arabia. So there you go. So we were just talking about um, now the Syrian rebels have missiles from October 18th, and then this is from August 18th. CIA spies smuggle 14 Stinger missiles. So there you go. Rebels attack oil gas pipelines in eastern Syria. Strikes add to concern about energy security in the war torn nation. It goes on and it says that the Syrian rebels attacked a pair of key oil gas pipelines today in Dair Azur province, two of the most serious sabotages of the nation's energy infrastructure to date. The rebels hold a number of key areas around Syria's oil and gas corridor between the attacks and the growing tensions with Turkey. There is concern that a civil war could cut off yet more energy supplies from the global markets at a time when we well, have yeah, Iran's embargo. But the thing is, is they're blaming it on the rebels, Syrian rebels. But then this other article from the BBC saying Kurdish rebels blow up Iranian gas pipeline in Turkey. They're saying the Kurdish rebels have claimed responsibility for a bomb attack on the natural gas pipeline in eastern Turkey. It says it remains unclear when gas flows will resume. Now listen to this. The Russian gas producer Gazprom says it will increase its supplies to Turkey because of the disruption. The company said it was acting following the request from Botas, the Turkish state gas and oil transportation company. Then I found this article a couple days ago. Gazprom bids highest for a Leviathan partnership because of its geopolitical power, but Noble Energy wants Western partner. That's right. Russia's Gazprom is a leading candidate to acquire the stake in the Leviathan gas field. However, sources connected with the negotiations say there are differences in attitude between Gazprom and Leviathan's U.S. and Israeli partners. So Noble Energy prefers a Western partner even at terms that are not as good as the terms offered by the Russian. The Leviathan Reservoir is still considered the largest deep water gas discovery in the world. It goes on and it says that uh, it's the most intriguing and critical business move in Israel's oil and gas industry this year. Then I saw this article just today, I believe it was the 19th. The U.S. supports the Southern Corridor project to weaken the monopoly on gas supplies to Europe, says Hillary Clinton. So there she goes again. Consider what's been happening in Europe for decades. Many European nations received much of their natural gas via pipeline from one country, Russia, she said. But that, now, but that has now changed in part because of the increased production here in the U.S. She goes on and she says that uh, they're trying to help promote competition and prevent monopolies. She's pushing the project because... We want to see countries grow and have stronger economies, but also because energy monopolies create risk. Russia successfully tests intercontinental uh, missile. This is from today. Defense Ministry says the ICBM has successfully test fired from Russia's northwestern military testing ground and hit a target in the northeastern peninsula. And in two articles I noticed that were kind of interesting, U.S. Envoy reveals secret assistance offered to Turkey in the PKK fight, talking about the Kurds. It says Washington secretly offered Ankara to have an anti-Bin Laden type of joint operations, special operations, I guess, against a number of the military leaders of the PKK. But it says the Turkish government turned down the offer, saying it would continue battling with the PKK on the basis of its laws and experiences. Then I saw this article just from a couple days ago I held on to. Kurdistan Alliance refuses any moves of Iraqi units to Kirkuk. Remember I was talking about that, about the Iraqi central government was going to um, uh, basically... Uh, defend the Kurds and against against Turkey, you know. So, but he goes in and he says he rejected this uh, Parliament MP rejected any military force movements to Kirkuk under the pretext of promoting its security, noting that any movement of army units to Kirkuk would create a new political crisis between the governments of the center and the region. Some 160 promising oil and gas fields discover in Turkmenistan, which is probably why U.S. military is going to assist Central Asia. 
Please join me in part two. Thank you.